we're beginning at start again uh, this Tuesday. So uh, six o'clock, uh, and it'll be chapter four. Chapter four, the great controversy that uh, we'll be studying. Vacation Bible School. You see there the dates, and again, it's getting here closer. New directories coming soon. What's that? There we are. Good morning, church family. I hope everybody got the reminder call, but if you want your picture retaken today for the church directory, I will be taking those after church. So um, I'll try to remember everybody, but come remind me because I may forget. So remember, church pictures after church. another speaker there she, she doesn't mind being up front all right amen uh today uh for our speaker is uh vilo weiss uh from the conference office and we're glad to have him uh after potluck he will have another uh discussion uh about an hour so i hope that uh, i know that the phone message went out i hope that you I was thinking about that and be prepared to uh, take part in that. Just more information on end time events, and uh, we would uh, we really appreciate that. This is March the 23rd, correct? Okay. In your bulletin, it says something's going to happen March the 24th. That's tomorrow, correct? Okay. The work would be uh, from 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock. And, of course, I like what it says, come when you can. Leave when you need, all are welcome. So remember, tomorrow, a little sprucing up for spring here in the church building, uh, maybe even outside, uh, but we do need to take care of God's house. I believe that's everything. Yes? We will enter into the church service. Inside your bulletin is the call to worship.
thank you, Father, for this beautiful Sabbath day. May the sun of righteousness shine into our hearts, and may your spirit fill our hearts and teach us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for remaining standing. We will sing 616, Soldiers of Christ Arise. Strength to strength. seated. Good morning, church family. Right now would be a good time to get your prayer cards, prayer request cards ready for uh, Viola's uh, Bible. Okay, the scripture reading. Okay, scripture is Matthew 24, 8. It says 24, 3 in the bulletin, but it's 24, 8. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Please bring forth your prayer request cards. All those who are able, shall we kneel for prayer? Our most kind Heavenly Father, we come before you in like fashion with bent knees and bowed heads before you, the creator of all things, the giver of life to each and every one of us. Father, we thank you for this opportunity, this invitation to be here on Sabbath morning, to be with you, the creator of everything. 
We would ask now for the Holy Spirit. May we invite that Holy Spirit into our hearts and our minds. We pray, Father, that the angels of strength will surround this property and keep away the evil one. We also ask, Father, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we'll keep the evil one away from our minds. May we be relaxed and comfort in your love. Lord, we pray and ask for the Holy Spirit to be with our speaker, Vilo. And as he breaks the bread of life, Father, that it would be the words from heaven with strength and power behind. For you and only you know us as individuals and the walk in our life and where we're at, what we need, and the words that we need to hear. Again, we thank you for the invitation to come and be with you. We know that the angels of heaven, the courts of heaven, are opened and are here too in the sanctuary. What a glory, what a gloriful day it would be when we're all together singing in praises, listening to you, Jesus, as you give us the sermon. Lord, we would pray for those who are not with us today. You know the reasons. If it's physical, we would come to you as the mighty physician and ask for a healing. Father, if it's a discouragement, we would pray for the Holy Spirit to speak to the hearts of those that are discouraged, to speak to your church family, Father, to let us know that we can go and help uplift the soul. If because on vacation or traveling, Father, we would just ask that you would give them mercy and protection to bring them back again to worship you here. We pray for our young people and our young families, for the new babies that we have uh, had in this church, Father. We know that the parent and parenthood, of, as we live in this time that we live, that uh, they need your power and your strength. They need our prayers for them, Father as they direct their young minds and teach them about Jesus, their best friend. We give thanks in all things, all purposes of season of life for our elders and our middle-aged father in this church. Thank you for watching over us. Thank you for bringing us here to church. We, Father, we would ask now as a congregation, as those who are watching and listening, that everyone here would be granted a place in the clouds of heaven when you come. For these things we pray in your name. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Uh, this week's offering is going for the uh, local conference advance. Uh, this week's offering reading was prepared by Heather Thomas Day. One of my favorite things to do to clear my mind and connect with God is to go on a run outside. Whether it's sunny or even on a cold day, running has been a great way to reset my thinking. Running consistently has been shown to improve memory, increase overall health, and provide people with better moods and more energy. When I used to run on a track team, our coach always emphasized focusing on the race ahead of us, not what was happening to the right or the left of us. There are many things happening in our world today, and if we focus on all that turmoil, it can become very discouraging. Yet God encourages us with these words in Isaiah 26.3. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. 
Together, we can run this race, and one way to support one another is by giving to the local conference advance. Did you know that the local conference advance goes to support ministries that serve our region and touch people's lives? One example of this is our summer camp, which is a place where many young people serve God and work together to bring other young people to Christ through music, games, and activities. As we give today, let's give with an open heart. You may now bring your tithe and offerings to the front and place them in the trays. Let's pray. No. We don't want to miss out on a blessing. Let us pray. Again, Father, we come to you with our tithes and our offerings, meaning the hours that we have spent and how you have blessed us in in health and abilities to go out into the workforce. Uh, as we bring these tithes and offerings back to you now, Father, we just ask that you will bless these funds to go to the needed purpose. You will make them stretch as far as they can, uh, in, in, in miracles maybe, but in some way, shape, or form, it's going to touch a life. That sometime when we're in heaven, that individual will come up to us and say thank you we will have no reason to understand why then as they explain the gifts that we gave through pamphlets or missionaries touched their lives and their hearts and they gave them to Jesus. What a privilege that you have given your people to take part in spreading the three angels' message through our tithes and offerings. So we would ask a blessing upon the, the money and upon the giver for these things we pray in your name. Amen. Sorry, Brittany. Brittany now has the children's story, so all the children come up, sit over here in this pew. Good morning and happy Sabbath. It's very exciting to see this many kids in the front row. Okay, so who likes science? Do you like things related to science? Okay, can anyone tell me what a solar eclipse is? I'm going to let Nora. When the moon goes in front of the sun. Excellent explanation. So I kind of have an example, and for you, those who didn't hear Nora, it's when the moon is going to come in between us and um, the sun. So, Nora, will you actually stand up real quick? Can you put your hand, can you hold the flashlight for me, and put your hand under it? Do you see what my hand is? It's a shadow. And that's kind of what's going to happen with the solar eclipse. Has anyone ever seen one before? Okay. Okay. 
Thank you, Nora. So the solar eclipse is about two weeks away. It's going to be on April 8th, and we get to wear these really fun glasses. Have you guys seen these yet? Guess what? I cannot see you guys at all with these on. So I'm going to take them off, and I'll let you guys pass them around, and you can see them. So it's going to be on April 8th, and I looked it up, and... Let's see, it's gonna, the totality is gonna be three minutes and 46 seconds. We're gonna be able to see it at 3.06 our time. I think all the schools are closing. So can anyone tell me what day God made the earth and the stars and the moon? Does anyone know a day? Nora? The fourth day. Say God made the sun, the moon, and the stars. And when I saw the last one, it was in 2017, and you could see it down in Nashville, Tennessee. And it starts, I think it's going to start around 1. And as you watch, you can see on my phone, my hands are all shaky, but you can see on my phone, you see it's starting to cover, and it's making like a crescent shape on the cushion. It will completely cover it to where it will be like a ring of light around the sun. You guys see it? And here's a video. This is how dark it's going to get. It's going to get so dark that you can see the stars come out. I like to think, I'm like, what do the crickets think? You know how they like to chirp at night? You think they're going to start chirping during the day? Okay. I also like the example. So, Samuel, can you be the sun for me? Come here. Can you hold the sun right here? Would someone like to be the earth for me? Come here, Braxton. Oh, wrong picture. Okay, and I need somebody to, well, let's do this example first. Can you walk around the sun, Braxton? Can you walk around? So this is what we're doing right now. We're going around the sun. Okay, we actually go much faster than that, but okay, can I have someone be the moon for me? Come here, Kaya. So the moon also goes around the sun, but the moon goes around the earth. So can you go around Braxton? And can you carefully, Braxton, try to walk around Samuel? We're kind of doing it. It's kind of tricky, but isn't our God so amazing that he made our solar system to happen like that? Amen. All right, let me see these real quick. This reminded me of a Bible verse. The Bible says in Psalms 8, 3, when I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. Hang on. So I wanted to show you this. You want to hold this for me? Will you let everybody see that sheet of paper? This is the path that it's going to take. So not everyone is going to see the solar eclipse. We're super special here in Indianapolis. We're going to get to see it. This kind of reminds me of another event. The Bible talks about when Jesus returns, we're going to see all kinds of different signs. And we can read about that with our moms and dads. But when Jesus returns, it's not just a path that he's going to take where only part of the country is going to see him. The whole world is going to see Jesus return. In Revelations 1-7, it says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. So I hope we can take this experience. I think the schools are going to be out, and we can think how awesome our God is that he made this for us to see. And we can also be thinking about how exciting we might be the generation that sees Jesus return. And I looked it up, and it's so important that we get to see this. The next one in the U.S. won't be till 2044. So you guys are going to be much older on the next one. Thank you. So let's pray real quick. Can everybody close their eyes? Okay. Dear Jesus, thank you for the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the solar eclipse we get to see. We pray that we will praise you and stand in awe as we get to witness this in two weeks, Lord, in your name. Amen. I'm not sure about our tides. If our moon was doing what the kids were doing there, <laughs> I think we'd be a little bit confused. I, I actually got to go through uh, that, the eclipse. I was driving at the time, 
and I was in Illinois, I was down by Carbon, I was down by 3ABN whenever it uh, went through, because it was at the, the total down there it was, and uh, I had to turn my lights on, uh, you couldn't see, and uh, the temperature dropped it by about 10 degrees. It was, you, you hear about it if you haven't been through, this is, it's an awesome, it's an awesome experience to uh, uh, go through this in, in Indianapolis. We get to, go right in the heart of it. So, and you got thousands and thousands of people are going to be coming into town. So be ready for that because down there, they were all over the interstate. If there was a wall, a Walmart, when I was running down through there, they were packed in there. Uh, so they'll be everywhere to see this. And now we have for our guest speaker, not such a guest, he's been here before, but we're glad that when we can have uh, the conference here as uh, speakers to give us the word. So we appreciate Bilo. How do you get it? There we go. There we go. Okay, great. We were in Tennessee, and it was a it was a total eclipse, and uh, it, it was it was really funny because the you started hearing the night sounds as it happened, and, you know, as it got dark, and then a few minutes later, when the sun came out the insects and everything else making the night sounds were perplexed. <laughs> they didn't know what to make of it. Uh, you know, night didn't come as it was supposed to. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it is a good opportunity evangelistically. Our, our church down in Evansville, uh, Camille Metz, who's the pastor of our church there, they had a big event a week or so ago on Sabbath they handed out 10,000 copies of the Great Controversy. That one Sabbath afternoon, they had a number of people come, and they also handed out uh, eclipse glasses as well. And so, uh, you know, this is some, you know, something to think about. It's an opportunity that we can take, uh, take advantage of. Last fall, I was in Albuquerque for my academy reunion, and I went to Sandy View Academy more years ago than I hate to admit. I, I can't believe that it was my 50th last year. I don't know how that happened, but it snuck up on me. And uh, we had a 95% eclipse. Uh, about 10.35, 10.40 Sabbath morning. So you know where most people were that were at church that day. They were outside. You know, because it was a good time. It was between Sabbath school and church. And Sabbath school was over. And, and we just had a ring of fire around the sun around the moon. It was 95%. It's, it's an amazing thing. So uh, I'm sure you can figure out a way to take advantage, um, advantage of that for, for God's, God's kingdom. Nice to hear the piano and organ play. I don't often hear that uh, in our church. It'd be nice, uh, nice to hear that. Thank you, ladies. And I want to say thank you for your faithfulness, too, in returning to God, that which is His. We have seen for the last several years wonderful increases. And that's been a blessing because, you know, we've also experienced inflation, haven't we? Uh, you know, what we pay for a lot of things has, has gone up. And so that's been a blessing to, to see God's work continue to, to go forward uh, here. And really exciting to see all of the children here. Uh, don't see that as much as I would, I would like to see it. Some churches that I visit, I, I, it worries me because if they have a few deaths, they're not going to function anymore. There's no child noise. Child noise is a good thing. 
when you don't have child noise, it's a more. You know, and the church is on its way to, to dying. And so praise, uh, praise the Lord for that. I spend most of my time, this is the last commercial, I spend most of my time working with our members and their legal counsel to set up estate plans. And I've had the privilege of serving some families here in this congregation. But especially if you have children, it's really critical because what happens if something happens to mom and dad? The courts decide who's going to raise the children. The courts decide. Because you see, the reality is we all have a will. We have a will that we've done with an attorney, or there's a will that exists in state law. Guess how much say we have in the one that exists in state law? Zero. And, and, and that's what happened in a, in a case in, in Oklahoma before I came here. We had, a, we had a dear, sweet couple trying to plant a church in a county where there was no church. Probably, this is probably about 15, 17 years ago. I don't remember the time. I was away sliding by. Mom and dad were killed in a motor vehicle accident. They weren't wearing their seatbelts. They were both ejected at the scene. Their two boys, younger than five, were shaken up but fine in the SUV in their car seats in the back seat. And the biggest fight ensued over who was going to raise those boys. And at the end of the day, their father's brother, their paternal uncle's petition to adopt them was granted. And you say, well, that sounds good. You know, it was their uncle. But you need to know that their uncle had no interest in spiritual things. Because you see, they didn't have a will. So the court had to decide who was going to be given the children. One of the families that they wanted that was on their list to raise the kids if something happened to them is a family that lives here in Indiana, and I've met them since I've been here. But because they didn't memorialize those wishes in writing, that didn't happen. So I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, you got a little brochure. If, you can, if we can be of service to you, please contact us. We'd be happy to do that as, uh, as a service to you and, and to protect your children. You, don't, you all received the letter from Pastor Vic about our emphasis this year on, on the coming of Jesus, the blessed hope. It's going to be our theme at camp meeting, encouragement to read the, uh, the book, Great controversy. You received uh, the reading. I want to encourage you to, to do that. What an amazing book, and encourage you to spread that. Uh, I, live in, I live in eastern Tipton County, about 25 minutes northeast of Cicero, out in the country, and, and I see farmers getting ready to plant. There's no harvest unless they sow seed, right? They spend thousands of dollars buying seed that's patented. It, you know, it used to be they could save seed from last year's harvest in the grain bin. You know, auger it into the grain bin and then auger it out and put it in their planters. But they can't do that anymore because it's patented. So they've got to buy it every year. But they throw it away in the ground in an organized manner with a planter. That's how they get a harvest. That's how we get a harvest for God's kingdom too. We have to sow seed. We have to sow seed, lots of it. Because, you know, some falls on hard ground. Some falls on thorny ground. Some falls in good ground. But we keep sowing the seed. Because there's going to be an amazing harvest. And I'll share that with you at the end this morning. Let's pray as we open God's Word. Father, please send your Spirit to teach us as we study together today, in Jesus' name, amen. For most of the 1930s, Winston Churchill warned everyone he could, and particularly in his home country of Britain, about the dangers of the rise of Nazism in Germany. He was very concerned. But the political leaders in Great Britain and, and across Europe didn't 
want to see what Churchill saw. You remember Chamberlain came home with a paper saying we've got peace in our time. That paper wasn't worth the ink that was on the page. It was worthless. You see, the horrors of the Great War were still too fresh and too recent and too overpowering in the minds of those in Europe. In fact, in a single battle, I have a friend, dear friend, that's been to Verdun twice. But in that protracted battle at Verdun, over a million French and German boys died. Most of a generation of German and French boys. Over a million in one protracted battle. Those memories were still fresh and overpowering. But in spite of that, on September 1, 1939, the Nazi blitzkrieg rolled into Poland. And two days later, Britain and France declared war against Germany. And that Nazi blitzkrieg rolled across most of Europe and far into Russia until it was finally repulsed at Stalingrad. And the tide began to turn against the Nazi war machine. A storm more intense than the Nazi blitzkrieg was coming for the whole world and for God's remnant in particular. At least three significant factors have already set the stage for this storm. The repudiation of the principles of our Constitution, the rise of the secular age, and the rise of Christian nationalism. Let me briefly unpack those for you. First of all, the repudiation of the principles of our Constitution. Let me give you Constitutional Law 101 if you didn't read my article in the Lake Union Herald. The understanding was at the founding of our country that the, that the federal government had only those specific powers enumerated in the Constitution or in a subsequent amendment. That's the Tenth Amendment. Unfortunately, it has done little good. We've run roughshod over it. Let me illustrate. There's nothing in the federal constitution, nothing in any amendment that says anything about education. So education should be a state matter. That's what the ten, Tenth Amendment says. If it's not in the constitution or subsequent amendment, the power is with the people. It's in the states. But we have a federal department of education, you know where. Before that, we had health education and welfare before it was split off. Jimmy Carter split it off as a thank you to teacher unions for their support for his presidential run. A recent Allegheny College poll found that people across both major parties one-third of them want decisive leaders. They want rough, tough leaders. They even want leaders that are anti-democratic. I'm not talking about a political party, but leaders that are willing, and this is what's scary, to violate the principles of democracy. Violate the principles of democracy. That's the kind of leaders people want. They're crazy. The Lord's messenger warned us, when Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when under the influence of this threefold union our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan. And that, the end was, and that the end was near. I remember when I was in, in law school, back from, went to night school for four and a half years on top of my full-time work for the Oklahoma conference. And I knew what prophecy said, but I wondered how. And here the Lord's messenger nails it. She says our country will repudiate 
every principle of our Constitution. And we have been doing it wholesale since the day, since Lincoln's day. Since Lincoln's day. They didn't ask me, but in my opinion, because of Lincoln's repudiation of the principles of the Constitution, I don't think he should be on Mount Rushmore, but they didn't ask me. Secondly, the rise of the secular age. We've seen it already in Europe. It's considered post-Christian. I remember in 2002, before I started law school, I sang with a large civic chorus in Oklahoma City. I think it was for 11 seasons. And we went and on a concert tour to Great Britain, and we sang in Canterbury, the mother church of the Anglican church, the Episcopal church in this country. Southwark, Winchester, and St. Albans cathedrals. And those cathedrals were empty. Hardly anybody there. If you go to visit, you've got to buy an entrance ticket. I remember we wanted to go see St. Paul, Sir Christopher Wren's uh, magnificent edifice in London. And we went on Friday to buy a ticket so we could go see it. We were going to go see it on Saturday. They sold us one, thankfully. We also wanted to go to Westminster Abbey, you know, a sort of famous church in British history. They wouldn't sell us a ticket on Friday, so we couldn't buy one. But Europe is post-Christian. And we think in some ways that we're exempt in this, United, in, in this country. But you know who's kept up? What is kept up with Europe's post-Christian secular world? Our universities. Our universities are bastions of secularism. They are an assault on faith. Pew Research found a few years ago in their, in their report that Christianity continues to decline in our country. 60, only 65% of Americans now identify as Christian, a 12% decrease over the prior decade. And one-third of those 35 and younger now report uh, no religious affiliation. That's why generally we don't see a lot of young adults in the church, and I'm glad you guys are bucking the trend. Keep bucking it. Keep bucking it. 40 million Americans have stopped going to church in the last 25 years, the largest change in church attendance ever in the history of our country. 40 million. Why? I think George Barna hit the nail on the head in, 20, in a 2022 poll. He found that only 37% of pastors hold to a biblical worldview. People sitting in the pews are not here in this book. He said, and I agree, a spiritual wake is needed, quote, is needed just as desperately in our pulpits as in the pews. Our culture has become secular and pagan. And by the way, that's not all bad because that was the culture of Jesus' day and the apostles' day. And what was the answer? It's still the answer. The gospel. Still the answer today. Thirdly, the rise of Christian nationalism. It's based on the faulty premise. It raises, it rose from as a response to the secular age, but it's based on the faulty premise that our country was founded as a Christian country. It was not. Now, there were a lot of Christians involved, but it was not founded as a Christian country, if you look carefully at the founding documents. And so, because many believe that it was, spiritual issues matter, particularly Supreme Court decisions that they don't agree with. Think about think Exhibit A, Roe v. Wade, which was overturned in Dobbs a couple of years ago. So, Supreme Court decisions need to be overturned. They believe in the support of Israel as a matter of foreign policy because they believe that Israel is still the Israel of God. 
They are God's chosen people. But what does the Apostle Paul say in Galatians chapter 3? Notice Galatians chapter 3. It's beginning with verse 28. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. It's not ethnicity that determines if you're the Israel of God. It's if you're in Christ. That's what matters. How many of you have done your DNA? A few of you? Yeah. My wife and I are the family historians. And, and it's interesting. I've done my DNA. My brother just younger. I'm the oldest of four. My brother just younger than me has done his DNA. And and for some reason, he has a little bit of Jewish blood in him, but I don't. Now, you know, what, what uh, kids get from their parents is different DNA. But who knows for sure? Because, you know, who knows what happened to the ten northern tribes when the Assyria took them, knocked, took them out in the 8th century B.C.? And not everybody came back from Babylon, right? Who knows? But a lot of people, a lot of Christians today look at the existence of the nation of Israel and they see that as fulfillment of Bible prophecy. It is not. It is not. The Israel of God today are the, not those that are ethnic Jews. It's those that are in Christ. Everybody, Jew and non-Jew, has to be grafted into the vine. The Apostle Paul writes in the book of Romans. <coughs> Excuse me. Just ran across this recently. It's, it's very thought provoking. The Conservative Political Action Conference. Jack Prasobiec said, Welcome to the end of democracy. We have to. We are here to overthrow it completely. We didn't get all the way there on January 6, but we will endeavor to get rid of it and replace it with this right here. And he raised a necklace with a cross on it. All glory is not to government. All glory is to God. He wants a theocracy. That's where Christianity is headed today. Does that surprise you based on what we know about Revelation 13? It shouldn't. Shouldn't. Tim Dunn, a guy that I don't claim from my home state, a billionaire Texas oilman, wants to turn Texas into a Christian theocracy. He's spending millions to do it. But he has dreams far beyond Texas. He's spending this money in a holy war against public education, renewable energy, and non-Christians. view of the coming storm how much time do we have i don't know but jesus says in matthew 24 verse 8 after he has told the disciples earlier as they were leaving the temple that one day there would not be left a stone upon another and historians tell us that the the second temple which didn't compare to the first temple looked like a mound of shimmering snow in the afternoon sunlight and the disciples couldn't conceive of it being dismantled stone upon stone. And they asked him, when will that happen? And Jesus began to answer that in, in verse 4. And he talks about wars and famines and earthquakes and other things. And then he says in verse 8, all these are the beginning of what? 
and that, that's actually the better, better translation of the Greek. My, my New King James says sorrows, but birth pains is actually uh, what's there. It's Greek oden. It literally means birth pains. In other words, these are cosmic birth pains. Now, every mother understands what birth pains are about. They accelerate and they intensify, don't they? Until your child is delivered. It's a good thing you ladies do that because if we guys had to do it, the human race would probably come to an end a long time ago. And you outlive us too. There's a lot more widows than widowers. But we're living in the day of cosmic birth pains that are accelerating and intensifying. And they're going to continue to accelerate and intensify. And we don't know when the end is going to come. And the Apostle Paul, quoting from the prophet Isaiah, says that God's going to cut his work short in what? Righteousness, that's right. He's going to cut it short in righteousness. And the Lord's messenger reminds us in the first chapter of volume 9 of the testimonies that the final movements will be what? Rapid ones. Remember when communist countries were dropping like dominoes back in the late 80s? It was breathtaking. I was pastoring in Ardmore in southern Oklahoma and I asked one of my members there who had grown up in Romania into into her mid-teen years and then her family left. And I said, what do you think is going to happen in Romania? Because to that point, Ceausescu was standing firm for communism. And she said, he is really clamping down. And then we took off for the holidays. Drove straight through to the East Coast. And by the time we got there, Ceausescu was out on his ear. The final movements are going to be rapid ones. They're going to continue to accelerate and continue to intensify. And because of that, what should be our focus? The coming storm? Some people want to make the focus, but I hope not, because if we focus on the storm, the rule of the mind is by beholding we become what? Changed. Then we become storms. Storms in our homes, storms in the churches, storms in our workplace. Lord, have mercy. God doesn't need any more storms. We need to focus on Jesus and the work he has given us to do. And by the grace of God, become spirit-empowered witnesses. We need to recognize our heavenly citizenship, proclaim the gospel, and make disciples. Let's look at these briefly this morning as we unpack them. First of all, Acts the first chapter, verse 8. Acts the first chapter, verse 8. The disciples are on the Mount of Olives and they're seconds away from Jesus leaving them and one of the disciples says, Lord, are you going to establish your kingdom? And he's getting ready to leave, not establish a kingdom. He's getting ready to leave in seconds. And he says in verse 7, It's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me. Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. And he starts going out. The Greek word behind the English word power there is dunamis, from which we get our word dynamite. Explosive power. We saw that on the day of Pentecost, didn't we? You had 120 believers. Now you've got 3,000 new believers approximately. And the church was growing like crazy. What is implied? You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. We are powerless without the Holy Spirit. Power comes when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. And then we become witnesses. The Greek word is martyria, from which we get our word martyr. 
And some witnesses paid the ultimate price, didn't they? A lot of them did, particularly in the Dark Ages. But what is a witness? If I'm court, in court, can I call John Smith to talk about what Steve Jones says? Can I do that? Why? Why can't I? Exactly. Hearsay can be admitted only under certain rigorous exceptions. Because you see, constitutionally, we have the right to face our accuser. A witness has to have first-hand knowledge. Second-hand doesn't cut it in a court of law, generally. When the Holy Spirit comes on us and empowers us, we have first-hand knowledge of Jesus. And that makes the difference. Makes all the difference in the world. If we would humble ourselves before God and be kind and courteous and tenderhearted and pitiful, there would be 100 conversions to the truth where now there is only one. This statement has always challenged me as a pastor for more than 40 years. We've had baptisms. Because I think about what could happen. Dr. Joe Kidder, who teaches in the seminary, teaches in the Christian ministry department, was following up a Bible study request card. Maybe you get some of those from time to time here at, here at your church. He was following it up and went to the door, knocked on the door and, and, uh, and said, you know, I'm here to see if we can make arrangements to study Bible. We got your, your, your response card. She said, I don't know anything about it. And furthermore, I'm not interested. He said, well, do you know somebody that is? He said, well, why don't you go see the neighbor across the street? So he did. And he met Ann. And she was interested. And he began studying with her. And the time came in the course of those studies that they, got to, they were studying about God's power to deliver. And she asked him, she said, do you think God can deliver me from my alcohol and tobacco? He said, absolutely. Call the elders in. They had an anointing. And she was delivered. And in due course, she was baptized. And he said, now I want you to start praying for your friends and relatives and neighbors. And she did. And in less than five years, 54 people were baptized. Including the lady across the street that turned down the Bible study request to start with. And to a person they said, we want what Ann has. What a testimony. That people would look at us and say, I want what you have. Secondly, we need to recognize our heavenly citizenship. Since COVID, I have never in more than 40 years of ministry seen more divisions in the church. Should we wear masks? Should we not wear masks? Should we vaccinate? Should we not vaccinate? Should we do this? Should we do that? I, I've never seen more politics in the church. We used to be apolitical because, you know, we need to work with whoever's in authority. But it just seemed like we were getting more, more and more political. And, and, and several months ago, we were having worship with our kids. And this text smacked me up against the side of the head. Have you ever had a text do that? Look at it. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 20. I thought, wow. Wow. It wasn't because it was unfamiliar. I just, I hadn't thought about it in a, in a, long, in a long time. Ezekiel, Ecclesiastes, verse 10. I ran past, I was there and then ran, ran past it. Just about back there. Do not curse the king, even in your thought. Do not curse the rich, even in your bedroom. For a bird of the air may carry your voice, and a bird in flight may tell the matter. The version of the Bible that was in the devotional thought we were looking at that even says, do not revile the king. 
And I thought, boy, I've sure seen a lot of reviling. I don't have a lot of time for it, but little time I'm on there, I, I said, I've sure seen a lot of reviling on Facebook. You know what I'm saying? Contrary to what God's Word says, what should we be doing? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. This is what we should be doing. Not reviling, not cursing. Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and giving thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. We need to be praying for our leaders. That's what we need to be doing. From the White House to the State House to City Hall, we need to be praying for our leaders. That we can be about the work that Jesus has given us to do. We know what's coming, but we don't need to invite trouble, right? We need to be praying that they will let us work freely as long as as possible. I've never heard more conspiracy theories. How in the world do you prove them? You can't. There's one conspiracy theory you can take to the bank, and it's called a great controversy. That one's rooted in God's Word, started in eternity past in heaven. You see, we have forgotten where our citizenship lies. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Now if you're reading along in the King James, and I love the King James, beautiful, majestic language. But the English has changed a lot. Word meanings have changed a lot since 1612. And if you read this verse, it says, for our conversation is in heaven. But a more accurate translation is, for our citizenship is in heaven. From which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a United States passport. I'm very proud to be a United States citizen. But the citizenship that means the most to me is my heavenly citizenship. We've got to quit focusing on the things of earth and be about doing what God wants us to do. And that leads to the third one, need to be proclaiming the gospel. In Revelation 14, very familiar passage to us. Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. On that Lord's day on the island of Patmos, as the Lord pulled back the curtain of the future and revealed future scene after future scene, John keeps saying, I saw, I saw, I saw. Most common word in the book. Now he hears some things, but most of the time it's what he sees. He says, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. The word angel here in this verse is not translated. It is transliterated. In other words, they chose vowels and consonants in English that most closely approximated the original Greek. If you translate, and those of you who know, know more than one language understand what translation is, you give the meaning, right? If you translate, it means messenger. Messenger. And then the question arises, well, what kind of messenger? Are we talking about a divine messenger or are we talking about a human messenger? To whom was given the gospel commission? To divine messengers? 
To whom? Us. That's right. What John sees on that Lord's Day, that Sabbath day, long ago on the island of Patmos, he sees God's people going everywhere. Everywhere. Proclaiming the everlasting gospel. The only time the adjective everlasting is attached to gospel, it's not a Johnny-come-lately gospel. It's a gospel rooted in eternity past in heaven when the plan of salvation was put in place. What is gospel? What do we, what's another word we sometimes use for gospel? Good news. Do you know where that comes from, you and Gellian? Do you know where, where good news comes from? It actually comes from the world of com military communication. Because you see, they didn't have the technology we have today. And so when a town's army went out to fight against another army, the only way they knew what happened was when a courier came running back with the news. And when he came back with the news that we had won, he used the word euangelion, good news. Christianity took that word to say, Jesus won. And did he ever? Did he ever? We were to go everywhere telling the good news. Jesus won. And because he won, guess who else can win? That's right, we can. And there's a lot of people out there that need to hear that good news. Because they're losing, they're not winning right now. They need to hear that news. And notice we're to take it to every nation. The Greek word is ethnos, from which we get our word ethnic. Jesus is not concerned about political entities. He's concerned that every ethnic group hear the everlasting gospel. Why is that important? Jesus tells us when he's going to come back. Look at Romans 24. You know, I hear a lot of people speculate about when Jesus is going to return, but Jesus makes it clear when he's coming back. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. Ethnos is a Greek word behind nations again there. And what happens when it's preached to every ethnic group? Then what happens? The end will come. The gospel will be preached to every ethnic group. We need to be very intentional about reaching immigrants to this country. As particularly in the first generation before they become like us. Reach them with the gospel. Because you know what they'll do too? Is they will reach back home where they came from and share the news. That happened in my own family. On my father's side, we're Volga Germans. You may, never, you may have never heard that term before. Catherine was a Prussian princess who married in the Russian royal family. We know her historically as Catherine the Great. And she issued a manifesto inviting her German countrymen to settle the Volga River region because she saw that as underutilized, underdeveloped, and she wanted to turn it into something that was prosperous. And so between 1763 and 1768, thousands of Germans left Germany and settled in colonies in Russia along both sides of the Volga River. My family settled in a town called Sherbakovka, south of Sarada, and about a half a dozen miles west of the Volga River. When my family came to America in 1876, because things began to change according to the promises that Catherine made, because you see there arose a czar that knew not Catherine, like there arose a pharaoh who knew not Joseph in Egypt, and things began to change, and my family came to America in 1874. 1876, rather, saddled in Marion County, Kansas, about an hour northeast of Wichita. In 1884, Elder Schrock and Conradi came and evangelized those 
those Mennonite brethren, German farmers that had come from Russia. There were 10 or 12 Mennonite brethren churches in that one county. And Elder Schrock and Conradi were so successful in evangelizing, they just about wiped out the Mennonite brethren church in that county. And the time was that the church in Lehigh, Kansas, was one of the largest west of the Mississippi River, if not the largest. And then they began to send literature and write back home about what they had learned from God's Word. And Elder Conradi was actually in Sherbukovka when my great-grandmother was baptized. God, in many ways, has brought the world to us. You hear, a lot of, you hear quite a bit of disparaging comments about America. But a lot of people sure want to come here, don't they? We need to be reaching them with the everlasting gospel. It'll change their lives and it'll change the lives of their family and friends back home, too. Because the end doesn't come until the gospel has been preached to every ethnic group, Jesus said. And you know, one of the reasons why I think that's getting ready to wrap up, I'm not a prophet or son of a prophet. Please understand. But what's the largest unreached group of people made up of many different ethnic groups? The Muslim world. And God is doing amazing things in the Muslim world. And many of them are coming to faith. Thirdly, and or fourthly, lastly, we need to make disciples. Matthew 28, not only need to proclaim the gospel, but specifically Jesus commands us to make disciples. He says, all authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You're reading along in the King James. Again, a beautiful, majestic translation of God's Word. It says, go therefore and what? Teach. And you might assume that comes from the same Greek word as teaching in verse 20, when in fact it doesn't. In verse 19, it is a different word. It's not the word for, for teaching. It's better translated, make disciples. And in fact, it's a imperative. More specifically, it's an imperfect imperative. Something that happened in past time and is supposed to continue to repeat itself over and over and over again as Christianity spreads. We are to make disciples. Disciples is the process of multiplication. You have one disciple for Jesus who makes another disciple and then those two go make four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, and so it goes. We work too much on the process of addition. We need to be working on the process of multiplication. It's called making disciples. What is a disciple? I like Dr. Bill Liversidge's definition, a good friend who rests in Jesus now. He said a disciple is one who is first of all committed to Jesus Christ. He's secondly committed to Jesus' church because Jesus is the head of the church. And he's committed to reach the world for Jesus starting in Judea and then Samaria and then to the whole world. Daniel 12 and Revelation 13 remind us of the coming storm for God's people, don't they? In Daniel 12, Daniel tells us there's going to be a time of trouble such as never was. Revelation 13 tells us Particularly the last half of that chapter tells us that if we don't worship the right way, we're in trouble, right? You've got to have the right credentials or you don't even participate in commerce. 
But that should not be our focus. We, need, we recognize that's coming, but that should not be our focus. Our focus should be, first of all, on Jesus. You remember Paul writes in Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and what? Finisher of our faith. That participle in the Greek is a present tense participle, which means we've got to continue to look to Jesus. Not an occasional glance. We've got to continue to look to Jesus. So we become more and more like him. And we need to be focusing on the work that he's given us to do. I want to suggest to you, and I'm going to, I'm going to share this afternoon, some, some important things about the Trinity. By the way, going back to the Gospel Commission, just for a moment, may, let me digress. Where Jesus says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit there in, in the Gospel Commission. There's two rules of Greek grammar that say those are three separate, distinct individuals. Two rules of Greek grammar. But what's the most important reason why we know there are three? Who is speaking there? Who? Jesus is, that's right. Can Jesus lie? No. Jesus says there's three. And if Jesus says there's three, that settles it for me. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. And then we're also going to talk about some other, go a little more in depth on some of the things that are happening. Because my favorite area of law is constitutional law. And there's, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. But we need to be focusing on Jesus and the work that he's given us. Because you see, things are getting to re ready to wrap up. And so this should be a time of prayer and increasing urgency, I believe. This has been weighing really heavy on my heart. This, we need to be spending more time in prayer. And, and, and there needs to be more urgency in our work because things are getting ready to wrap up. Because you remember the Apostle Paul says, and I think he's speaking about, about our day in Romans 13, 11. And do this knowing the time, that it is now high time to wake out of our sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. It's time to break loose from our Laodicean ledge, leg, uh, uh, lukewarmness and be involved for Jesus. What will be the results if we become spirit-empowered witnesses? If we recognize our heavenly citizenship? If we're about proclaiming the everlasting gospel and if we make disciples... Turn to Revelation chapter 7. It's an ex this is an exciting passage to me. It, brings me. it gives me so much encouragement because sometimes it seems like the, the work of God grows so slowly, particularly in this country. But notice what John writes here. After he's written about the 144,000, he says, After these things I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could number of all nations, ethnos is behind it, nations there, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Notice verse 13, then one of the elders uh, asked John, he says, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where do they come from? It's a rhetorical question. And John says to him, Sir, you know. And then the elder answers his rhetorical question. He says, These are the ones who came out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white 
in the blood of the Lamb. It's an innumerable multitude. And by the way, this is the narrow road crowd, right? The broad road crowd is not going to be on the sea of glass. This is the narrow road crowd. There's going to be a great harvest. This tells me that this text is, is describing the result of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and latter rain power on God's people as they go everywhere sharing Jesus and making disciples. I can't speak for you, but I hope and pray by the grace of God I can have a small part to play somewhere, somehow, how about you? Six seventeen, six seventeen. We are living, we are dwelling. We are living, we are dwelling in the grand and awful time. In the age on ancients telling, faintly living is so blind. Boys and girls, at, uh, be sure and see me at the back door because I have something for you this morning, okay? Father, thank you for the privilege of being alive at this time of all times in the history of the earth. Thank you that you want to use us. Angels would gladly, divine messengers would gladly go 
and share the everlasting gospel. But you want to use us to reach the people about us for your kingdom. Thank you for what you're going to do through us by your grace so that we can be a part of that innumerable multitude along with those that we've had the privilege of touching for your kingdom. In Jesus' name.